Physicians. Dr. Del Rio was elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2013 and in 2020 was elected as the Foreign Secretary of NAM. And we've been, um, as many of you probably know, have been um, engaged with the National Academy of Medicine on these conversations. And Dr. Del Rio has been, has been more than a partner in making sure that we're able to get the best speakers for those events is really in the middle of so many different things related to the pandemic. And so we're really lucky to have him today. So um, Carlos, thank you again for joining us today. I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about some of these issues. And if we have time at the end, we'll take some questions from the Alliance members. So first thank you, thing Susan, for the invitation. I, the first thing I'd like to ask you about is the pandemic continues to evolve. And while we've made great progress, we still obviously have a fair amount of work to do within the United States and globally. What are your thoughts about the next phase for efforts to end the pandemic? And how concerned are you about the impact of the new variants and the recent surge in some communities? Well, Susan, th those are a lot of questions. Obviously, I think we've made incredible progress in our country in, in because frankly, because of, of, of vaccination, we have done a, a I would say, a, a really good job getting vaccine to about, you know, 50% or so of the population. The challenge is that we still have about 50% of those, so the population unvaccinated, and many of them, I mean, some of them are not eligible, they're under 12, but many of the population that hasn't been vaccinated either are reluctant or, or frankly are opposed to vaccination. And I think that's our biggest challenge. Our biggest challenge is how do we, how do we convince people that are in defense about vaccination to get vaccinated? And that's why I think that our public health uh, message has to learn from, from marketing and from several other uh, methods into how do we, because it, it's gonna be, it's a hyper, you know, target marketing in which you need to go to individuals and what may work with what community is not going to work with another one. But we're going to have it's 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 a it's a labor of love, it's an intense labor, and it's going to require a lot of effort. I, I do think that one opportunity that we have missed, and I've been talking about this, is you know, now that cases are not very high in our country, and we keep on saying that, you know, most people hospitalized or newly diagnosed are people that are un unvaccinated. I think it'll be interesting to, to take a lesson from, for example, smallpox and say, you know, if you find somebody um, infected today or hospitalized today with COVID, how do you reach out to their networks, to their families, to their close contacts and try to get them vaccinated, use that opportunity. And unfortunately, because of the way COVID works, you have to do it very quickly, right? We cannot rely on, on this very slow way in which public health functions, in which you submit a report and you do this. It's almost needs to be a rapid response team. And I'm hoping that some of the funding that, that CDC and others are gonna be receiving for this rapid response teams will actually help do those kinds of things because I think we're gonna be need to be very targeted in, into individuals and communities. You know, the, the variants are gonna to continue to be a problem. This virus, this is what RNA viruses do. This is what they do, they mutate. As long as you are, they're transmitting, they're gonna be mutating, they're gonna be changing, they're gonna be adapting. They're gonna become more transmissible. They'll become less, you know, susceptible to antibodies. So, you know, the only way to stop the variant is really by stopping transmission. And I will end up by saying that, well, I see the U.S., a lot of people in the U.S. saying, okay, we're done with this, you know, we're over, we're opening. The reality is for the rest of the world, the pandemic is not over. And I remind people that in the first six months of 2021, more people have died of COVID globally than they died in the entire 2020 year. And, and we cannot forget that this is a global pandemic and our job, is, is local as public health, but our job is also global. We have to figure out how to stop, uh, how to get vaccines globally, because I, I do have a little bit of a, I would say a sense of, uh, of, of injustice when I see us discussing whether should vac we should be vaccinating, you know, kids between tw the ages of 12 and 15 in the United States, yet most healthcare workers around the world are not vaccinated. And, and elder individuals are still dying. So I think issues of, of global equity are, are really at the forefront of this. And uh, I would encourage all of you, if you haven't, uh, as Susan mentioned, we've been doing this webinar, APHA, with the National Academy of Medicine called COVID-19 Conversation. And the last one is called, you know, Tale of Two Pandemics and talks about global vaccine equity it was great. And I would encourage those that haven't seen it to just go to the website and find it and listen to that recording. I think it's very insightful and will give you a lot of information. And we had great speakers, including 
you know, Helene Gale, Gale, you know, Bill Fagy and many others. Um, so there's there's a lot in your answer, um, but let's let's focus in a little bit on the vaccines right now. There's been discussion about booster shots, about um, and the adverse effects that are coming up daily, or whether or not they are a major problem, still are getting a fair amount of discussion. So what should we be dealing with? What are your thoughts on what we'll be dealing with over the next six, 12 months related to booster, related to, um, to the variants, related to the issue of, of the fact that this is still such a, a raging global pandemic? Well, you know, as far as boosters are concerned, uh, I mean, at this point in time, I don't think I'm ready to recommend boosters. As I told, I reported the other day at the Washington Post, I said, you know, the, the most important boosters we need is to get people unvaccinated, vaccinated. That's what the booster needs to be. We need to boost, you know, population immunity in order to, to stop this pandemic. I, yeah, I do think boosters are going to become a reality, especially as, as more variants emerge. And particularly, they're going to be interesting and they're going to be more useful in people who are more urgent and people who are immunocompromised. There is already some data from uh, the group at Hopkins showing that in transplant recipients getting a third dose significantly improves their response. I think we're going to see more of that. And, uh, and I also think that, you know, that is going to be a matter of time. But at this point in time, I think we're getting lost into discussing boosters. I would hope that the, the first thing that the FDA does is not consider a booster, but consider actually uh, approving, giving full approval to some of the vaccines, because I think full approval to the vaccines will, will help change some minds of people that are still in the fence about getting vaccinated. So you talked a little bit about what we need to do that's different from what we've been doing in terms of getting to the vaccine hesitant and, and um, and FDA approval from emergency use to full approval would be one piece. But how do you think that, what are the other ways we can reach the vaccine hesitant? I um, heard a news story this morning about how the administration, the federal administration is sending a group of, of officials and health officials into Missouri to deal with the spike that's going on there and, and trying to create a team. Is that the way to go is to have these roving teams that are able to respond quickly? Are there other things you think of? Well, you know, I think it's going to be, you have to work with local trusted members of the community. I remember being uh, down in, in South Georgia in a very conservative community where, where, where vaccination rates are low and somebody saying, you know, I don't want to hear somebody telling me, I don't want to hear that I need to get vaccinated from, you know, from somebody in Washington or from you. I want to hear from the fireman who sits in church with me. When he gets vaccinated, I'll get vaccinated. So we have to work with, with local community spokespersons and leaders and get them to get vaccinated and then talk about the vaccine. I do think, you know, we have talked about working with African-American communities, with Hispanic communities. There's an artist in MNWR today talking about how North Carolina has significantly increased the rates in African-Americans and Hispanics. I think working with local communities, with churches, with, with trusted members works. But also one, one group that we haven't talked a lot about is, is it's actually uh, Republicans and conservatives and particularly women and conservative women are not interested in getting vaccinated. And I have, I, I wrote a letter to a subcommittee of Congress uh, the other day who was dealing with hesitancy and said, you know, we need every member of Congress, Republican or Democrat to go back to their districts and talk about the vaccine and really emphasize the importance of getting vaccinated. I, I, I personally find it almost ironic to not to say incomprehensible that the Republicans haven't actually taken the vaccines and run with them because the reality is they could have easily said look this is a vaccine I mean we could criticize a lot about the last administration and the response to COVID but the way they put together the Operation War Speed they put resources into that and they helped develop a vaccine was clearly a success and I'm surprised that the Republicans haven't said look this is our vaccine we developed it we own it you know, the best thing you can do as a Republican is get the vaccine because this is our vaccine. This is not Biden's vaccine. And that would have been great. But instead of that, they're the ones pushing for people to not get vaccinated, which just, it just totally, I just blows my mind because it's, it's such a clear example of how you could have used this in a more effective way. Uh, you know, the last thing is obviously how do we deal with, with what, 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 what worries me the most is how 
public health is being disenfranchised. I mean, I see what happened in, in Tennessee recently, and I see many public health departments being essentially, you know, you know, their, their legs being cut off, their ability to emphasize. And again, this is not about COVID. You know, we have plenty of other diseases that our health departments deal with. And, you know, when you say you cannot be pushing vaccines in children, you know, wait until you get an outbreak of measles in that community. Wait until you get an outbreak of many other diseases. So I do think that from our from our role, also as working in public health, we have to do something to, to, to honestly rescue public health because I do think public health is under attack. And, and I'm, I'm, I, that to me could be the worst legacy of COVID is really a very, you know, uh, weakened local public health department that will just be ineffective, not only confronting COVID, but many other diseases. So beginning to talk about youth and returning to school, returning to work, or um, I know that you've been working closely with universities talking about how to engage and return to a, a full sports program. What do we... What can we do to operate these things safely in the world in which we're currently we currently know we have? And what measures are going to be most effective and we expect to see continue in the next year? Well, you know, again, this is going to be a combination of things, right? I think that that the combination of, of vaccines, masks, and other mitigation strategies are going to continue to play a role. Uh, I can tell you, for example, my, my university, Emory, has decided that all students, faculty, and staff need to be vaccinated. And if you're not vaccinated, then you're going to undergo a weekly uh, COVID testing. And for the meantime, you can not wear a mask when you're outdoors, but indoors, everybody has to wear a mask, whether you're vaccinated or not. So, I mean, I think that we will see this, this, this things continue to play. My biggest concern, again, is that in many states, uh, you're having, you know, governors and legislators pass to pass laws saying, you know, mandates are are not uh, are, are not allowed, and you're not going to be able to mandate it. And I mean, right now you talked about Missouri. I mean, many healthcare, you know, uh, executives in Missouri are asking that they're making, you know, they're asking that vaccines be mandated among healthcare workers in their state. And you have the governor saying, absolutely not, we're not going to allow that. So I think that's, you know, that's also going to make it very complicated for for many of us that are hoping that that we will see, you know, the word mandate. It's, it's, it's a complicated one, it's a very charged one, but there's gonna be requirements. I mean, for years, you know, those of us working in healthcare have had required to be, I've, I've been had a requirement to get my flu shot on a yearly basis. And, you know, I don't see why you wouldn't add COVID to what I need to have as a, as a healthcare provider in order to work within a hospital and see patients. But, but COVID again is, is charged with such a political overtones that I think is going to make it complicated for many places to quote unquote mandate vaccines. But, but I think you're, going to, you're not going to see mandates from the federal government. I think you're going to increasingly, as Dr. Fauci said the other day, you may see mandates at the local level. I think a lot of it is going to come from businesses. At the end of the day, many businesses and many organizations like that are going to make mandates. But I can tell you, for example, in Florida, you know, where the cruise industry said we want to mandate, we want to make requirement of 100% people vaccinated to get in cruises, you know, DeSantis said, absolutely not. You can't do that. You will be violating a state law. And, and just that creates a, a, you know, a really complicated issue in which, you know, the businesses are trying to do what I think is the right thing to do. And yet you have uh, the politicians, you know, doing exactly the opposite. So political interference with public health will continue to be, I think, something that we're going to have to, to learn how to navigate. And quite frankly, we're going to have to learn, those of us working in public health are going to have to learn to do over much more than we did in the past. I mean, I've been working in HIV all my life and while HIV was political, I don't recall it ever being like this. Yeah. Um, so the Alliance is focusing on engaging communities and working with multi-sector partners and networks and leading with equity. Do you have any suggestions for us about what issues we should be helping to address? Well, you know, I think, uh, I think you know trust. Trust is, is one of the things that we've lost in a lot of the, the, our, our communities, and many of them we never had trust to begin with. I mean, I mean, think about African Americans and, and other communities; they've always had distrust with, uh, with 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 uh, with with the healthcare system and with the government. And somehow we need to figure out how to 
use this opportunity to build trust in the community and how do we get community more engaged in, in the activities that we're doing. I've been telling people that one thing we need to do is, you know, for example, disenfranchised communities, African-Americans, poor communities, is not just about we go there, we vaccinate you and see you later. What are the other things those communities have that we can help address and, and we, can, we can give something to them? Because it's not just an issue of getting you vaccinated, it's an issue really about, you know, for many of these communities is, is loss of employment, is, you know, you saw recently the, the increase in, you know, last year having more opioid deaths than any other year. So I think there's going to be a lot of these issues, sort of the, the downstream impact of COVID is going to create a lot of need for, for, for public health to really engage at, at the, in a very different way, quite frankly. And maybe, maybe, maybe something that pandemics do is pandemics bring public health and clinical medicine closer together, right? That's one of the things pandemics do. Maybe we can learn from that and, and have a more integrated approach from public health and clinical medicine, and quite frankly, public health and primary care working together to address many of the issues that are, are being seen in our communities. And that idea was beginning before the pandemic hit, and so it'll be interesting to see what the implications are for um, that coordination and the better integration once we are in a somewhat post-pandemic world. You talked a little bit about assuring that we have a more rapid response component of public health. Are there other changes that you think the public health system should undergo or other, or other pieces that you think of what the public health system should be assured of to prevent future pandemics? You know, I, I, think, I think that at the, at the core of what we do in public health is data, right? It's information systems. And, uh, and data and information systems are so important. Uh, and, you know, we need to be able to, to get down to the community level and know, you know, know, the more you know data of your community, the better you are. And, and how do we get that information in real time? I mean, I, I, you know, for example, I'll show you that if you look at, if you try to find data on HIV surveillance right now, you go to the CDC website, the most recent data you'll find is from, is from 2019. I mean, public health information is so far behind the reality. So when people say to me, well, what has happened as a result of COVID in, in HIV testing? I don't know. It's like, there's no data for me to look at very rapidly and, and know those answers. So I think, I think our data systems need to be much better. Our, our information systems need to be much more agile that we can actually get information and act upon information. So I think information is one thing. It's, it's big data is maybe relying on other things like Google Analytics and many other things is, is sort of this, this big data component. The other thing that I think we need is, is, a, is more use of, I would say, you know, technology in, 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 in public health. I mean, people talk about M health in a very effective, you know, imp impacting clinical medicine. How can we have M public health be more active, right? What are the kinds of things in M public health that can be developed? And then, you know, the other thing is, again, going back to, People talk in clinical medicine about, you know, precision medicine. How do we turn public health into precision public health? How do we work at the level of, I mean, what are the kinds of information you need in a specific community at a specific time? I'll go to, for example, again, what I do is HIV. I mean, do you need to promote PrEP for everybody or do you need to be very targeted in who are you going to target with PrEP based on the data you have and be much more efficient in the use of your resources and in the use of your information? to really target it to the needs of those that, that need the information and not just send it to everybody and hope somebody gets it. So I, I do think that, that there's, there's, there's much more that public health can do to, meet, to be much more responsive in a very effective way. And, and I do think that, that, that the time is now, I think this is a right time to do exactly that, right? So this is my last question to you. And then we'll take a couple of questions from folks who are here. So let's talk about a step beyond the pandemic and it's building on, on some of the conversation we've had thus far. We have seen what the pandemic has done in terms of highlighting the glaring dis health disparities that exist between communities and the ongoing concerns about not just the pandemic, but, but the disparities that existed before and we are afraid will exist after. What can we do to reach the communities that are most negatively impacted? 
You know, I think for many of us, like, again, going back to what I've done is HIV, health disparities is, is what we see. I mean, the reason we have HIV in this country is because of enormous health disparities, and many of them are, are driven by social determinants of health, right? Poverty and employment. I tell people, like, you know, many years ago, I participated in a study called HPTN 061, in which we were trying to get young Black MSMs offer them services so they can get HIV tested and they can get STD testing because we figured that's what we needed. We as researchers thought that that would be a really useful information, you know, service to them. And what we found is that young black MSMs, what they wanted from us is ways to find employment, ways to clear their criminal record, ways to, you know, the things they needed were not what we as researchers thought they needed, right? So I think it goes back to this whole issue about how do we tackle social determinants of health. And the problem is that the most important social determinants of health are not driven in what causes disparities are not within the purview of health, right? I mean, increasing education, increase, increasing job opportunities, uh, housing, all of those are outside of what public health does. And it goes really then into saying, how can public health bring together or partner with others to, to really address all those things that are really driving disease? Uh, to me, I'm at a point that I, I also don't want to continue hearing about disparities. I want to see interventions to address disparities. I, I, I want to see public health and researchers be more involved in, in addressing interventions, trying to tackle disparities rather than, than just you know, get another study that shows that just there's a disparity. Because I mean, we know there's enormous disparities. Let's, let's just figure out how to address them. I, I do think that that COVID may give us an opportunity. It was, maybe it was a wake up call. You know, some people are talking about disparities when it's something that many of us say, well, this has been here for a long time. So maybe this is a time to use that opportunity to bring disparities to the forefront. My biggest concern is that COVID will be over and yet again, you know, the poor communities and the African-American, Hispanic and other communities are gonna be again left, left behind as, as we see, you know, I mean, I read over and over how the, the rich, the millionaires have gotten even richer during the pandemic, right? So I do worry that that we may see even come out of this pandemic even with greater disparities than we started with, and that would be to me a, a total tragedy. So how do we how do we address this? And to me, that brings to another important role that I see in public health, which is advocacy. Those of us in public health, I mean, I, I have said that one course that is missing in every single school of public health that I've looked at is advocacy. How do we teach people how to do advocacy? How do we teach people how to communicate to politicians and to, and to decision makers? Because at the end of the day, you know, talking to a congressional staffer may be the most important thing that you do as a public health person when you have the opportunity to do that. And, 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 and we in public health need to be able to learn how to communicate, not with key values, but with, with clear examples that will make you know, decision makers uh, make the right decisions. And that to me is the other role that we have in public health. I think to me, learning how to be, to do advocacy is gonna be a powerful way in which we can actually begin to address disparities because it's not about, you know, p-values. It's, it's all about, you know, the human experience and talking about that, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to congressional congressmen from Georgia. And when I talk about the opioid epidemic, I always try to find somebody in their community that is suffering from the disease. And when, and when I talked about, you know, Mrs. Smith, who is in your, you know, community, who is having this problem and he, she cannot access buprenorphine treatment and she really wants to get on therapy, but, you know, all of a sudden you get the eyes of the congressman, you get their interest, you know, this is somebody that they're serving. So, so we need to do a better job teaching our students and our trainees uh, the importance of advocacy and how to not how to do it and how not to be afraid, because the reality is, 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 is public health and politics are, are, are intertwined. And if we, don't, if we don't interact with them, we're missing an opportunity. And I tell you, it's not, it's not necessarily pleasant all the time, but it's really important that we, we actually interact with politicians and with all parties. It just, you know, I don't care if it's in I don't agree with your politics. I still need to learn how to communicate with you and with your staffers about things that really matter. And, and to do that may be one of the most important things that we can do in public health to again, bring health disparities and, and community disparities into focus. Thank you. As a former congressional staffer and um, 
long time lobbyist on behalf of public health. That, those words warm my hat hard as a, as a closing to our questions. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the chat related to both the data and building rebuilding trust. But there's a question that comes in from Benny Lafonza saying, in, some in the media continue to frame this as an individual freedom versus public health as big brother. The public health frame is different. No one has, has an individual right freedom to kill others. How do you suggest we reframe our communications approaches? You know, that's a really good question. It is, is this whole issue about individual freedom versus public health. I mean, I think, I think public health is about, I think from the very beginning of the pandemic, we even frame it between, it was public health versus the economy, right? And we somehow miss the opportunity to say, look, it's not public health versus the economy. In order to have the economy, you need public health. How do we make sure that, that those things actually are aligned in such a way and the way you do that is by recruiting people that are actually working in that field and who, who actually are the economists and say, you know, one of the most effective things I've done is, for example, when I've been working with, with uh, let's say, you know, as an advisor to Delta Airlines, when I started working with Delta on, on, on COVID, while they were losing billions of dollars, I mean, they were bleeding money left and right, I said to them, look, guys, the first time, every time I, I get on a plane, you start your uh, your your public service, your announcement about safety, you talk, the number one priority is the safety of our passengers. I said, let's start by framing COVID as the number one priority is our safety of our passengers. And let's figure what we need to do for safety of the passengers, because that's what your business is. Your business is about safety. That's how you make your money. And all of a sudden the CEO looked at me and said, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I talked in the language that they understood, right? Yeah. So we need to figure out how to talk to people in the language that makes sense to them, that they feel comfortable. And it's not public health here trying to you know, ruin your business. It's how public health is actually going to make your business much more profitable and, and much better and much you know, helpful to the public. So I think that the same thing in my mind happens with this discussion between individual rights and, and, and public health is somehow we need, you know, years ago, there was a study that I asked Americans what public health means. And many Americans thought that public health means health for the poor. We don't even... I mean, most Americans don't even know what public health is. So the first thing we need to do is we need to brand ourselves. We need to really you know, tell people what public health is, what it means, and that public health is actually individual health. That actually, public health is about you. It's not about, you know, it's about you being safe. The way, you know, a public health message saying, wear a seatbelt, it's about you not getting killed. It's about you being safe in the highway. The public health message about not drinking and driving yeah, it's about you not killing others, but it's also about not killing yourself. So somehow we need to figure out how do we tell people that public health is about your individual you know, rights. It's about your ability to actually feel comfortable. It's about the ability of me going outside and, and knowing that I'm not going to be run over by a drunken driver in the street. And, and that to me is how we need to frame public health. It's about not just this amorphous idea that, again, people think public health is about poor and the others, and it doesn't have anything to do with me when somehow public health has to has a lot to do with me. I mean, you know, the reason we the reason we develop as a nation is because we did public health, right? We get I tell people that the difference between a developed and a developing country is the ability to have, you know, separated drinking water from stool. Once you do that as a nation, then all of a sudden you start developing, right? I mean the reality is that 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 changes dramatically your, your ability to be a developed country. Is is it's economic development Development relies on public health. I think years ago, the, the, the World Bank did this when they finally said, you know, development and health are intimately related. And I think they've done a good job internationally to, to see that. But how do we get our communities to understand that public health is about economic well-being, is about the health of our community, is about the, the, the communities that are, have strong public health, have attract businesses, you know, have jobs, have opportunities. And I think that's where we need to, to make a difference because otherwise people continue to see public health as, as big brother and as, as mandates. And, and somehow in, in our country, that's, that's, not, that's not the message that gets to people. Um, thank you, Dr. Dowie. We have taken far more of your time than we said we would. And I think you're actually even on vacation this week. So I really do appreciate you, you joining us today. Do you have any Last message or words that you want to leave with leave us. You know, with? to me, to me, public health. To me, I mean, I, I have so much respect and appreciation, and and 
I think one of the one of the crown jewels of our country is public health, starting from CDC all the way to state and local health departments and people that are in the front front of public health doing this on a daily basis and and quite frankly dealing with 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 all sorts of different issues and you know my my former boss Jim Kern you know always needs, used to say that that public health when it's at its best nothing happens right it's quiet and 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 all of a sudden when it's an emergency you say oh where was public health you know it's so somehow we need to figure out a way that we even when things are doing fine and they're quiet how do we keep public health in the forefront how do we get I think now we had an opportunity to develop relationships with the media and others, and somehow we need to continue engaging them. I think one of the things that we need to do is, is work with, with, with reporters to get them to understand public health and be our advocates because, and the last thing I would say is, is social media. You know, How do we get all of us in public health to really engage in social media, to communicate and to get messages to others? Because at the end of the day, how we communicate has changed. And, and we in public health have an important role to play to, to get the right information to people in, in, in this day and age. And it's not just during COVID, it's everything else that happens, right? I mean, it's, it's every single health issue, you know, in the future is gonna be, you know, let COVID be over and we'll be dealing with diabetes and obesity and so many other things. How do we continue to engage the media at different levels and, and all those public health issues? And, and that to me is something that, again, we have a, we have a role to play, and you know, at the end of the day, it's it's in the benefit of our of our you know communities and the benefit of our you know citizens and our nation. So so public health is to me at the core of what what this country should be all about. Thank you so so much. I really appreciate your time, and um, I am seeing both clapping and and messages in the chat that other people are also really appreciative of this of your time and your great messages. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Um, and now we'll turn over to Angie to take us through the next step. Hey, thanks so much, everybody. Um, let me share my screen again here quickly. Um, so I think, you know, Carlos Del Rio did an amazing job, I think, of teeing up a lot of the issues that are going to be really critical for us to discuss over the next six to 12 months. Um, what we thought we knew now is really um, tee up the discussion a little bit by hearing with a couple of our partners who are really working with folks from different sectors. Um, and then we're going to turn it over to you all to also um, lay in on your thoughts. So um, first, as we're looking at kind of issues and actions that, that we think uh, people are dealing with, we thought that Stephen Massey, who works with Meteorite and is helping to manage the Health Action Alliance, um, which is a group that brings businesses together, would have a great perspective for us. So um, I will hand it to Stephen just for a quick update, and we may also send you some things in the chat feature for other feature, uh, tools or resources that we can share. Great. Uh, well, thanks so much, uh, Angie. If you wouldn't mind letting me share my screen, uh, I would love to just share a few quick slides. Um, and, and first, I want to just acknowledge uh, the uh, APHA and the Alliance for uh, all the great work that you are leading uh, and also the opportunity to, to be here today. Um, on behalf of uh, the Health Action Alliance partners, um, it's uh, a real pleasure and a privilege. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, the Health Action Alliance uh, really is focused on unlocking the power of business to help accelerate the COVID-19 response, strengthen vaccine acceptance, and help rebuild public health. Uh, and we're informed by top experts in public health communications and business management, founded by Ad Council, Business Roundtable, CDC Foundation, the DeBelmont Foundation, and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and it, we're powered by my team uh, at Meteorite. Uh, you know, I think against the backdrop of a surging Delta variant, now rates of new infection are climbing across all 50 states. There are three real messages that uh, we are delivering to businesses as part of our network. First, we know that employer encouragement and uh, paid time off, uh, that, that's working. Uh, and so we're encouraging employers to continue to really double down on removing barriers to vaccination uh, and making it as easy as possible for workers uh, to get their vaccines. Paid time off, paid leave for recovery, covering out-of-pocket expenses, considering modest financial incentives for certain populations, offering internet access or language support um, is also helpful. Um, for businesses that can, look, reach out to your public health department, try to organize an on-site or near-site vaccination clinic, 
all of these strategies have proven to be really effective. For small employers, the paid leave tax credit that's part of the American Rescue Plan makes it really easy to offer paid time off because you get fully reimbursed for employees who need time to get vaccinated or recover from side effects. The Kaiser Family Foundation released new uh, research a couple of weeks ago showing that these strategies are working. Uh, in fact, employers uh, that provided paid time off for vaccines, you can see here that their employees are much more likely to have been vaccinated compared to employers that did not provide paid time off. Because employers are really trusted sources of information, in fact, they currently rank only behind physicians as the most trusted source of facts about COVID-19 vaccines. You can see here that employers who are encouraging vaccination have much higher rates of vaccination among their employees than employers that do not encourage vaccination. When you ask folks who are unvaccinated right now, what would get them across the finish line? Well, 37% of them say that they would be more likely if their employer offered on-site vaccination. 30% said they'd be more likely if their employer offered a $50 incentive. And 28% said that they would be more likely to get vaccinated uh, if their uh, employer offered time off for side effects. So again, encouraging vaccines, sharing facts and offering paid time off and other support those things are working and we're encouraging employers to double down. Number two, we're encouraging all employers to really take a risk-based approach to workplace safety uh, that, uh, that meets this moment. And again, uh, we've seen cases of infection now double uh, over the past couple of weeks. There are areas of the country where cases are up 400%. In those areas, it's really important for employers to take a risk-based approach to some of their safety, on-site safety and reopening protocols. Uh, and just today, we launched with the National Safety Council a really cool uh, interactive decision tool that helps employers answer tough questions that they're asking right now um, from the health perspective, legal perspective and other perspectives. And it's a, almost like a choose your own adventure tool on our website. Uh, and I would encourage any employer uh, that wants some help understanding what are the key questions they should be asking uh, and how to navigate those questions uh, to lean on this tool. Uh, it was developed with the CDC's NIOSH team, uh, with the National Safety Council and with, with legal experts. And then third, we are about to launch a new initiative uh, on Monday, calling on employers across the country to support working parents who wanna vaccinate eligible children against COVID-19 and catch up on other routine immunizations. In May, of course, the FDA expanded emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine to kids 12 and older. But today, just weeks before the school year begins, just 30% of eligible adolescents is vaccinated. And we know that real barriers remain for parents who wanna vaccinate their children. So on Monday, we're bringing together uh, the director of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky, uh, and the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, together with other top business uh, and public health leaders for a national town hall on childhood vaccinations to really offer suggestions to employers about how they can strengthen vaccine uptake among children uh, within their communities. And look, we think this is a public health issue and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir on this call, uh, but we also recognize that this is a core business issue. And I'm thrilled that the US Chamber of Commerce, the Business Roundtable, uh, the American Staffing Association and so many other uh, business groups have signed on. What we're asking here is encouraging employers to support working parents who wanna vaccinate their children by offering paid time off and scheduling to working families, offering transportation support, uh, language support, childcare incentives, the same type of things I described earlier. And we're also encouraging employers to do this now because the school year is less than five weeks away. Of course, it takes five weeks for a young person to be fully vaccinated with two doses. Uh, so we, now's the time. And if younger children become eligible later this year, businesses will have these policies already in place. So those are the three messages. Keep doing what you're doing if you're a business and providing those, uh, the paid time off uh, to workers. Uh, take a risk-based approach to uh, reopening and support working parents who want to get their kids vaccinated. And if you have questions or want to learn more about any of these initiatives, I encourage you to visit us online at healthaction.org or email me. Um, I'd love to work with any of your organizations uh, that'd like to sign on to any of this work. So thanks, Angie. Thanks so much, Stephen. As you can see, um, a lot of exciting things happening with businesses. And I think other great partners for us in public health and 
and with other sectors to make sure that we're really connecting with. So um, great first update, thank you. And then now I'm gonna turn it to um, Sue Watson, who's with Public Health Institute, who's gonna tell us a little bit about a couple of their efforts out in California, including um, Californians Together Toward uh, Health and uh, some work that they're doing on contact tracing and others. So Sue. Thanks for that, Angie, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me just give you a little bit of overview about Together Toward Health. Um, we are a statewide initiative coordinated by the Public Health Institute to stop the spread of COVID-19 and strengthen health and resilience in California's disproportionately impacted communities. It's a dynamic pooled fund that's supported by 25 philanthropic organizations that allows us to channel resources to locally rooted groups and organizations um, working to help communities respond and recover. And our team has been weaving a web that coordinates uh, connections between local and state health departments and the CBOs as well. So our funding is reaching more than 400 community organizations across California to help support services that are rooted in how community members live, located where they are, organized by people they trust and offered in the languages they speak. And, and I'll just share this one image um, so that you have a sense of the impact that we've made thus far. And this is just from, from a portion of our organizations. But some issues that we're hearing um, definitely resonate with what we heard this morning that there, with recent increases in cases and concerns around the Delta variant and our states reopening, what that means for where we are with COVID, and we also have a slowdown in vaccinations. We have a persistent under vaccination and, and disproportionately high case rate among African Americans in the state. We do have a delay in young people getting vaccinated. Uh, there, many of our CBOs are bringing up testing again and this the ongoing need for testing. And, and quite frankly, at least in California, we do have some, some of the CBOs are experiencing burnout. They've been running a, this marathon at a sprinter's pace and it's been tough. Uh, some of the responses to the challenges right now that we're hearing are continuing to explore uh, more creative and flexible ways to get the vaccines to people. Uh, that may be using new spokespeople and influencers, doing more door-to-door -door actual vaccine efforts, and trying to be creative in how, the, how incentives are used. Uh, there's new messaging, or, or not new, but the messaging around continued mask wearing indoors and in crowded spaces. We're definitely hearing this out of Los Angeles, and I won't be surprised if that starts to come up in other places in the state. We have organizations that are really lifting up right now using youth as the new trusted messengers, um, both for adults and for their peers because of the influence that they have in families. And I think something that we've all been holding on to, we had one of our organizations really speak about the need for patience, particularly in um, African-American, Latino, immigrant, other communities, meeting people where they are, both physically and emotionally. And fortunately for us with our Together Toward Health funding, it is flexible enough that allows the CBOs to pivot uh, as needed based on what they're seeing on the ground. And I'll leave it there, Angie. Great, thank you so much. So um, we've not had a chance to hear, I think partly based on what Carlos Del Rio and the groups kind of mentioned in chat, we've talked a little bit about just the importance both of how the public health measures we're gonna to need to take, working closely with healthcare partners, working with community-based organizations and businesses, certainly schools. Um, so now I just wanna turn it over to all of you all. And if there's something that you'd like to update in terms of what you're working on, what you think we're facing that we all need to be focusing on, um, this is time for us to have a little bit of time to think about that. Um, if people would raise their hands on chat, that would be great. And um, also feel free to use the chat like you have been doing. I think that's been really effective. Anyone, something that you just would like to share or have us think more about?
Angie, I have, it's Mary Pittman at PHI. Okay. I have one concern about the, um, what appears to be the dismantling of some of the testing and contact tracing uh, infrastructure that we've developed and the concern that once we lose that, it'll be very hard to build it back. And I'm wondering if anyone has some creative uh, solutions that they're aware of. Um, not all of the local health departments can absorb that capacity. And yet I really see um, those trained contact tracers, many of whom who have deep uh, community trust and, and multiple languages that, that they're able to speak. Um, we've seen them be extraordinarily successful. Um, even, uh, you know, their, their metrics are outstanding as contact tracers, but we know there are so many other roles they can play, but there is not a really good glide path to get them into other public health roles. Uh, I'd love to hear some thoughts from some of our colleagues in terms of how that's happening. We've been doing a lot of workforce development to prepare our contact tracers for uh, new positions and um, want to see more of the transition happen. I heard this saying, I know many of you have worked with contact tracing and trying to think about long-term workforce issues. I'll turn it over to all of you. Well, um, my, um, my name is Tyler Doherty. I'm with the National Indian Health Board. Um, I know in some tribal communities, um, some of those contact tracers um, who um, before becoming contact tracers or case investigators for the tribe were community health representatives um, and, and um, were seen out in the community and, and would be um, employed by tribal health systems to do house checks for elderly patients um, and, and really be an active act, uh, have an active um, role in public health and that made the communities um, more familiar with them. And so when they would call and try to get information while contact tracing and case investigating, there was trust there to get honest and reliable information from them. And so um, as, as we've seen some of the cases fall um, in tribal communities, luckily across the country, some of those contact tracers, case investigators have shifted back to um, performing CHR duties. So um, I, I think that's, you know, something that is, is, is um, able to be replicated. And, and, you know, tribal communities have used community health representatives um, for a number of years now. And, and it really helps to bridge um, a gap uh, a, a trust gap between, um, you know, public health uh, policies, regulations, safety measures, and the community, um, because someone that you know and trust and have engaged with for um, previously before the pandemic um, w was conveying those those messages to you. So I think um, because tribal communities often are very rural. And, and I know rural areas are suffering with some low vaccination rates um, due to other issues possibly not ex um, being experienced by tribes as well. But you know, ha having that trusted voice um, and and someone that you know calling you to check up on you while after you tested positive for COVID nineteen, I think really helped um, get that sort of information and reliable information. Thanks so much, Tyler. Does anyone else have thoughts on kind of this issue of how we can continue to think about that? I might jump in. Um, hi, this is 
Burra from the National Association of Community Health Workers. Um, and just sort of to build off uh, Tyler and Mary's point, uh, yes, so those kind of contact tracers you're sort of describing is probably what we would say fall under the sort of community health worker model. Um, and right now there is so much money coming down through the American Rescue Plan, specifically for community health workers. Um, and it's really, right now the, the tough thing is a lot of that money is short term. So while there is massive scale up of community health workers all over the country, really in every state is gonna get uh, some of this money to scale up community health workers. Uh, what we as sort of not are thinking about is how do we advocate for, um, you know, keeping that workforce on and making sure there are career pathways. Um, and ideally for us, we like to see career pathways within the sort of CHW profession. You know, people start as CHWs, they get to supervise CHWs, you know, then they're leading teams. We have many uh, CHWs who go on to lead CBOs and organizations um, to work in public health. Uh, so those are the career paths we like to advocate for and, and build for. I hope that sort of um, answers your question a little bit. Uh, and I believe, Angela, you had your hand up a little I, bit ago. I <laughs> Sorry, I missed you. That's okay. I'm Dr. Angela Michelide. I'm with the American College of Preventive Medicine, but I'm also uh, trained in behavioral sciences and health education. And what I'm very curious about is whether anyone on the call has had success or the constituents they serve has had success in convincing vaccine resistant individuals to get vaccinated. What have been your messages and your strategies? I saw Jim Furman raised his hand. Can you hear me? Now we can. Yeah, can you hear me? Sure. Okay, good. Uh, so I'm Jim Furman. I, what we've learned is that you have to shift the conversation. Uh, that is, it, all, most of the, the reasons that people are hesitant, I just read the summary from a Vox article, which I thought was all the reasons people provide for not getting vaccinated and lack of access to conspiracy theories, to concerns about uh, the vaccines themselves share a common theme. A significant portion of Americans don't believe the vaccines are worth the potential downside. The problem is, and what we found works, is people are considering the downsides in terms of their personal risk, not the, the real lethal threat risk that they present to their older relatives. Almost no people, our data shows, understands that older adults are between 90 and 630 times more likely to die if they get COVID than young people. Our data shows when people understand that fact, they will not, uh, they don't want to kill grandma. Uh, and they don't want to, and so shifting the conversation to it's not just about you, it's about the fact that people you know and love could die as a result of you not being vaccinated or them not being vaccinated, I think is the key shift uh, that persuades people. It's about the people you love and keeping them safe. And for people who say it's God's will, you remind them that God's will is very clear. The fourth and fifth commandments, honor thy father and mother and thou shalt not kill. So I think it's a shift to understanding that the real downside risk from not being vaccinated is not to you personally, it's to the older people in your lives. Great, thank you. Next, I see Stephen Massey. And then I have Scott Massey. Uh, great. Thanks, Sandra. You know, I think for uh, employers, one of the things that we're hearing, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, of course, is that there are these sort of incentives and paid time off that really works for those who are on the fence. Um, but it's also really important for employers to not just talk, but listen, um, listen to the unique needs, uh, the unique questions that employees who are still on the fence might have. Uh, this isn't about convincing someone about what to do, but instead to really listen to their concerns and then connect them to facts or trusted sources of information like physicians who can get their questions answered. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what, what we're hearing from employers is that there seems to be a certain segment of the population that no matter what they try, it doesn't seem to work. But what we do know is that getting as close as possible uh, and listening with empathy to those who still have questions, uh, leveraging trusted messengers who reflect those communities, leveraging your employee resource groups, for example, or leaders in the community, bringing in a public health physician or a physician into your workplace for a town hall uh, with, uh, with your employee base. 
all of those strategies uh, are, are working and are, are, are moving the needle. Great, thanks so much. Um, now I have Scott. No, oh, thanks. And um, <clears throat> I mean, Angela certainly adds, adds the question that's, that's so important. We've been doing a lot of research on this. And um, actually, uh, while I believe with everything Stephen's saying, and we've been doing a lot to support with business partners to convince and other activities, we're finding still uh, our latest national survey is that the, the primary care physician or people that say my doctor, as we ask them, is the most important person that they need to hear from. Not a doctor, not a public health doctor, their doctor. And we know that, uh, of course, there's equity issues of if people have a primary care or healthcare home. But uh, we need to figure out a way to do a much better job uh, with all the parts of, I'm saying doctor and also community health workers, the spectrum of who people interact with. Uh, and the piece I just put in the, in the, uh, the chat uh, is that we, we wrote in the New England Journal, these are not all vaccine hesitant people. There are probably five to 10% of people that are refusers and deniers, and we have to keep that small. But the rest of the people are ready. We just have to reach them in different ways. And there, there's, like Stephen mentioned, there's a lot of ways. Like Jim mentioned, there's a lot of ways. But they're, the person they trust, which is somebody in the healthcare field, is the one that we have to get engaged. And I'll just say the final piece. I know that Carlos sort of wrote off that mandates won't happen. Uh, I think I'm moving more to after looking at all the data, we need to try to support a federal mandate or something that's going to give cover uh, for requirements throughout the um, spectrum. Larry Goss and I have been writing on this that we think we have the legal uh, strength for it as well as the precedent, uh, but we need the public health people, many of you on this call to be able to support it. And we wrote about this on measles when we had measles outbreaks in, 19, in 2019, uh, but there's nothing more important than COVID now. So I wouldn't throw that away yet. I, I think as the variant gets there and the next variant or the variant plus gets out, we have to think of all the mechanisms and the policy mechanism with mandates might be something that we need to have to get to the end of this, um, this stays. Thanks so much. Um, Sue Polis, I noticed just posted some interesting things um, from a jam board, which is a term I hadn't heard. Sue, would you like to tell us a little bit about that quickly? Sure, thanks, Angela. I'm sorry, I'm still eating lunch, which is embarrassing, but that's why my video is off. Um, we just, uh, we've been working with the Y on uh, uh, overcoming vaccine hesitancy, uh, building confidence and access. And so we're working to bring city leaders and Ys together uh, in partnership around the country. And so when I said uh, we did a jam board, we've been uh, doing a lot of uh, uh, virtual meetings with folks and a jam board simply um, a mechanism where folks can post uh, based on questions posed to them, uh, answers or questions themselves that we're using to kind of guide and inform a toolkit that we're putting together to support the initiative. Um, and these were some of the answers folks shared with us, um, what's moving the movable middle. Um, uh, we've heard um, an array of needs around very specific populations, including um, the homeless, including uh, younger aged uh, children that are now eligible, um, among others. So we're, our communications toolkit is a uh, purpose toward trying to support uh, these more distinct populations. So that's something we can share as we're further along. Thank you, that's great. I'm sorry to call you out while you were eating lunch. Just seemed like interesting information. <laughs> great, so um, anybody else have something you wanna weigh in now on this issue? I'm going to reach these different populations. Go ahead, Tevin. Yeah, um, just real quick. Uh, so we've seen success with our Act of Love campaign, reframing public health precautions and getting vaccinated um, as, as an act of love towards your family member, towards your community. And so we've actually seen some success around that. Um, we have actually re, um, retooled some of our messaging to highlight the importance of getting your children vaccinated before the school year starts um, and making sure that you call your um, IHS or tribal healthcare provider uh, to get those appointments scheduled. Um, we have been providing uh, postcards with um, inspiring messaging for people who get vaccinated and, to, and prompting them to mail those postcards to family members that they know might be experiencing vaccine hesitancy. 
um, just as an op just another mode of reaching out. And then finally, um, and, and, and this obviously resonates in tribal communities, is the culture keepers, the, the, the fluent language speakers in tribal communities are, are normally elder, elderly elders, and um, there are not many of them remaining. And so it is intensely important for young tribal members, um, you know, vaccine hesitant tribal members to be, you know, to be informed about that fact, you know, your duty to your tribe, to your culture is to protect those who can speak the language, who have the historical knowledge and the traditional knowledge. And that honestly has been one of the biggest um, motivators in tribal communities to get to get folks vaccinated. Thanks, Ty. Good evening, and I know night. Sue Watson I missed a minute ago. So go ahead, Sue. No, that's fine. I, I'm glad other people are sharing. Just I put it in the chat, but you know, we definitely have seen success through faith placed. We we even start changing it from faith based to faith placed, being in a safe uh, arena. We have pastors and ministers who may have been against the vaccine, and they're in conversations have been able to shift uh, that this is more about the the community and the people that they are, are preaching to and that they need to be promoting for their safety, even if they have their own issues with, with the vaccine. And that has turned things around in, in communities, as well as you know, right here in, in Oakland, we have some fantastic uh, community-based physicians. And one of our grantees is now doing conversations with them that they're videotaping. There's a lot in, in the, the Black community here where people keep bringing up the Marshawn Lynch, Dr. Fauci interview and how they wish that there could be more of those. And so they're actually taking that model and bringing in uh, hip hop artists and other community leaders to be engaged in these conversations with local doctors that can be spread by influencers so that people can hear their questions being asked by people that look like them and being responded to by people that look like them. That's great. And I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative to flip the question a little bit for you all. And that's um, one of the populations I think we've all heard that we need to start getting to our youth. And so your example, I think, is a good one that we had heard that what you youth really want to talk to, and we've talked to interns and others also, are really from their peers, but also from people who they know in their community and who they trust. And so just to know if all of you all had other ways that you would work well with youth or if that's a place that we all can figure out together that we need to move ahead. And that we heard things like rock star doctors that are local are, uh, you know, the trusted advisors more than, you know, maybe an influencer or something like that, someone that they could trust and know has an opinion. Okay, so um, I will also give you a heads up that we thought next month we would concentrate on kind of how we reach you. So everybody um, come to the meeting in August ready to talk about that and we'll, we'll build on that a little bit more. Um, other things people wanna jump in with or think we need to make sure that we're focusing on over this next six to 12 months. Um, in addition to whether reaching people, oh, sorry. Um, I think Ali Makdad, sorry, had tried to uh, yeah, have I some thoughts on data. No, we, in addition to the briefs we have for every state and for every country in the world, we now have on our web a visualization tool that shows you at the zip code what's the hesitancy level. So we believe this will help public health professionals to know where to put their efforts in order to convince people to go and get the vaccine. Exciting, thank you. This is Janet Hamilton, and I put this in the chat too. And I think, you know, one one space is working with people to encourage them and seek it out. But I wonder too about um, groups also encouraging providers to sign up because we've already talked about how important that provider patient relationship is. And I, um, 
you know, you all many times know the providers in your individual communities as well. And I've seen a lot of providers that have not offered the vaccine. And even that little step of, you know, someone can talk to their provider and then get it right there in their office um, versus providers referring people to pharmacies and other locations. And, you know, that just allows people to fall out of the system. So just encourage, I would say our members are um, from, from CSTE are trying to think about how to reach the provider community more to actually offer the vaccine. Other issues, other sectors, I know um, we haven't heard as much from, I know philanthropy has been integrally involved in everything we've done. Any thoughts on from philanthropy folks, kind of where you're going or where you think we need to be focusing? Hi, Angie, um, this is Brittany Giles Control of the De Beaumont Foundation. And I, I realize, you know, a lot of this conversation is focused on, um, you know, the immediate priorities that we have with vaccination, but I also just wanted to plug that one area where we're headed is um, we're going to be fielding our, our PH win survey. So really our national survey of the public health workforce this fall. Um, I think this is going to be really fascinating. I think particularly just given the last year, um, all of the turnover that we've seen, as well as identifying some of the, you know, workforce capacity and development challenges that health departments are facing. So um, yes, my colleague, um, Sam Sinek, just talked more into the chat there. Um, and I also just wanted to give a plug to another project that we're leading with many folks on this call. So I see um, Monica from the Kresge Foundation and um, Judy at CDCF. Um, so we're also partnering together um, with the Bipartisan Policy Center on a project called Public Health Forward. Um, and this is a project that is seeking to um, create a new vision and, as well as an implementation and roadmap plan for where public health goes from here. Um, I think particularly with, you know, increased funding, increased presence, um, and focus on public health, this is a project that will seek to really define what is it that we need out of a capable public health system that can also advance equity and protect the health of the communities that we serve. So Sam also popped in a one-pager um, about that project, but just want to say that it's really going to go in depth into how we can, um, you know, think about workforce challenges, data, and IT, um, infrastructure, funding, governance, and law, um, a lot of different areas. But I think it's really going to hopefully set us up well um, to have a piece to look back to to say this is how we can influence the future of public health and reorient it um, post pandemic. So just wanted to put a plug in for those and happy to um, you know come back to the group once some of those findings and the final deliverable is out later this fall. Brittany, and I see we have a bunch of hands up now, so I will turn it to um, Ron next. Hi, thank you. Um, well, I know all of us want to take some breaths. Um, I'm thinking about our preparedness responsibilities uh, related to the variant, related to you know reaching the hard to reach communities, related to potential hospitalizations and PPE, et cetera. And I'm thinking as a group, you know, we, we can't afford to go back and say, well, we weren't funded, right? We didn't know. And, and as a group, how we can better assure that we're prepared in the event there is another wave and some of the unexpected. Um, hopefully it won't happen. But I think as a group, we can think through how to be best prepared. Great, thank you. Um, I have Scott from Convince. Sure, thanks. I, um, I was just gonna add, I don't know if people know that the um, Surgeon General released his first report today on misinformation. Uh, and it, it has some prescriptions I think that really fit well for not only the public health community, but all of us with our networks. So I think your question, Angie, was what about the next meeting? I think we should figure out a way to, to put something up on this. Uh, We've been, you know, we, I edit the Journal of Health Communication now for 25 years, and we've been addressing this for a while. But 
the depth and the scope and the state-sponsored misinformation and the challenges to public health that I think were outlined by Carlos again earlier um, are, are not just happening by chance. And um, we need to figure out ways to counter the misinformation. And for this to be the first report out of um, you know, Dr. Murphy's office, I think is um, a pretty strong statement. And we need to support the administration to, to move every way we can uh, in our, with our communication proudness and our public health background. So I, I'm just mentioning that so we all can start to offer support for it as well. Great, thank you, great report. And uh, I think for all of us, this politics and misinformation are certainly gonna be things we should all probably be dealing with over the next months to come. Um, I have Stephanie has her hand up next. Yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. I just wanted to comment on what Janet was saying about primary care, delivering and vaccines. One of the challenges we've been having within the jurisdictions we're embedded in is that the primary care providers are telling us it's taking them nearly an hour to convince someone and they can't meet their requirements trying to do that. We've put ambassadors on the ground and navigators and they're taking almost 1.7 hours to get one vaccination in an arm. So these ratios are very disproportionate here and, and it's a challenge. Um, one of the ways we were thinking providers can get around that is to use community health workers and navigators ahead of their appointments to answer a lot of the questions the patients might have in advance, but every office doesn't have, you know, the navigators and the community health workers to do that. And that may be something public health can partner with. I had put in the chat previously um, about long haulers. And we found in a study that 64% of the public, they don't know about long haulers. And nearly 40% of the people when told about it, they who were unvaccinated would now consider vaccination. So my question to the group is, what, how are you addressing um, the long haulers so we can learn from each other? Are you running any campaigns or advertisements or education on um, mm -hmm. people who are having long-term sequelae from COVID? And I don't see anybody jumping in, but I think it's certainly something that I agree with you that we need to be focusing on. And I, it's always pretty staggering to me that some of the things people are doing is six months, a year out, but I don't think mm -hmm. people are worried about the one or two days of side effects from getting the vaccine. But I think if they knew about kind of some of these really long-term things that can impact you, it might also change some minds. Anyone else? Thank you. Okay. I think we're near the end of our time. Anything else that you all want to make sure that we cover, that we kind of put on the table as issues to deal with? We've talked about different sectors. We've talked about vaccine hesitancy, politics, um, getting people vaccinated. I think we're going to have our work busy. Um, other things around kind of reopening society that we want to make sure we're you know, putting at the forefront or something that just came to mind. This is your time on chat or virtually or orally. I see Jim Furman. Uh, yes, I, the other thing I think that I'm seeing, I come from the world of aging and aging services, and I see anecdotal cases where an aging agency is collaborating with a health department or a fairly qualified health center or other groups, but it's not happening in thousands of communities and it's not happening strategically. So I think another element is to foster intentional strategic collaboration between networks of public health, primary care, and aging, uh, both top down and bottom up. Uh, and that's something that is doable, but has to be recognized as important and done intentionally. Great, thanks. Anyone else, other issues? things you're seeing in your community that for some reason we haven't touched on yet. Uh, great, I don't see any hands. 
Well, as you all can tell, our discussion was going so well together that we thought we didn't need to move into breakout groups. So um, I really have enjoyed this discussion and really appreciate how well everybody, I think, used the chat and the ability to kind of take turns talking. Um, if there's anything else that you want to make sure to weigh in on, um, we have a lot of resources people have shared, and we will save those and send them out to you all so you have them. Um, otherwise, if there are things that you think about over the next day or so that you want us to deal with, it can be more than a day or so, but feel free to send them to us and we'll make sure to capture it as part of this discussion um, and we'll get a good summary, but um, really appreciate everybody. Um, thanks so much to Susan for moderating our earlier discussion and to all of you all for a good conversation and we'll look forward to talking to you in August. Have a good rest of the summer until then.